Welcome to the Lost Signals Discusses Film and TV. Using the revolutionary Manzora Mosi Thurlow scale, or MOTS, we scrupulously review these art forms with an emphasis on narrative structure. Join us for another entertaining episode. Hello, all. Welcome back to the Lost Signals Reviews Film and Television. And today, we are moving to Nebraska, no, Arkansas, whatever, I keep confusing them, in the mid-80s to uh, start our own farm. I am your uh, struggling farmer, Scott Thurlow, here with my fellow family members who have been, like, sort of wrangled into this farm with me, Jonathan Ian Manzer. I actually looked up uh, OKC Koreans and came up with some great suggestions for Korean barbecue. Yeah. Well, so next time I'm there. <laughs> <laughs> next time you're out that way, you know, hit yeah. it up. And uh, here also with Stephen Amosi. How's it going? And Joe Soria. Uh, I was going to say something, but I'm not going to say it. So. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Don't be racist. Yeah. It wasn't racist. It was more <laughs> po- potty humor, which I'll right. save for later. No, potty humor is fine. It's, full, it's full of potty humor, this movie, in fact. True. That is true. We'll get to that. <laughs> Absolutely. But I suppose I shall just tell you, well, my logline is because this is an A24 movie, first of all, it is uh, First Korean, which is what, what I've come up with if you've, okay. seen first, if you've seen First Cow. Although you also mentioned Field of Dreams. I did. Which is a great lock line. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. pick whichever one you want. I think they both sort of fit. And uh, I, I did also get vibes of Mudbound, which I suppose mm-hmm. ties into the plot, which I will tell you about. So basically, I, I don't know if it said like exactly what year, but mid-80s. 80s, somewhere, yeah. somewhere in the 80s, a Korean family, husband, wife, two children move out to, apparently they've been like working in California and other things. And they decide to buy a farm in Arkansas, live on, live on the land, and live off the land. At least that's their intent. Mm-hmm. They work at a chicken sexing factory, you know, like basically a chicken plant. And it's just like basically, more or less a family drama, right? And the grandmother, like they bring um, Monica's the wife. They bring her mother over to live with them. And that sort of like sort of causes a little wrinkle in the family dynamic. But even though she, she is a beloved family member. So it's just them basically struggling to make it work. And... Sometimes the farm is on the cusp of failing and the family sort of fractures and splinters like the, um, their, their youngest son, David, has health problems and's pretty like more or less stable. Their, their daughter is, I think David's like what, five, six, maybe seven at most. Yeah. And mm-hmm. Anne's like 10 or 11 or so. Right. So it's basically just them trying to make it work. Like, again, having the family struggles, like trying to hold our family together and their lives and work together. And that's pretty much it. Like there's a lot of other details that get sprinkled in, but. That more or less is the plot. So it's, it's again, one of those slice of life things that I know he likes quite a bit. And I think, Joe, you like them too, right? So like that kind of like style of things. It's like, it's one of the, the our joke was one of the two films that A24 makes, right? So like, <laughs> right? it's in that vein. It's in fact a combination of, of, of yeah. multiple ones in one. <laughs> exactly. So. <laughs> exactly, right? right? So it, like, if you like that style, if you know what that means, and that's basically what you're in for, and that's what it delivers. So with all that, like my personal score, and I know I've been doing this and I guess I'm going to keep doing it more and more, is that I'm giving it at least a two and I would say like a 2.25. Like it's pretty fucking solid throughout. I don't think it deserves a three, but it's strong for like other reasons that aren't necessarily the plot. Just because, again, it is a grounded, like down to earth story of a family. Again, like I said, trying to make it work in this farm and their struggles, etc. So for that, I think narratively, it's solid as, if not solid as hell, if you will, solid enough for it too. So what do you guys think? I, this is a slight, uh, maybe not even slightly, an above average slice of life tale. I think it's held together, but it's kind of a, a general tale, but it's, I think, elevated by uh, this comedy uh, especially the in a sense, even though there is uh, toilet humor in this, as you mentioned earlier, uh, it's a lot of subtle kind of humor things. Mm-hmm. So there's a really dramatic scene towards the end with the parents arguing in this parking lot uh, after trying to sell some goods, and uh, it's a really emotional scene, really touching. And then the guy there suddenly just comes out the back door, and like, "Oh, you guys are still here." But that's uh, like it's a lot of the humor it doesn't. It's not the focus. It's kind of background or subtly uh, at. Uh, relieve tension throughout uh the film uh i enjoyed it i uh 
I think the character work is great in this, but it's not a three film. It's uh, uh, it's a well done slice of life. So I'm giving it a two. Sure. I really uh, enjoyed this movie and would have given this a three if it wasn't for the like completely contrived ending to it. Um, and like, I, I, I thought it was freaking great up until that point. And I still really, really enjoyed the movie, but the barn burning down and then like up, oh, all of our problems are gone because like this brought us together was kind of like took me out of it a little bit. Um, go ahead. Uh, there's a actually funny thing that I liked at the end where you watch the, uh, the father slaving away on the farm trying to make this work. And uh, the grandmother tosses some weeds out and uh, saves the farm by pure accident, uh, in a yeah, sense, yeah. Uh, versus all of his work. Man. But... Yeah. Um, I mean, the, are you sorry? Are you done, Steve? I, yeah, go ahead. That's, that's <laughs> all right. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I really, really thought this movie was, I mean, I really like this movie. I'm not sure where I'm going to find the faults, um, but this is a character uh, character study and it has four uh, to five main people that are highly focused on. I mean, it's, as you said, it's, it's, a, it's like the most A24 type movie. It's heavy. It has lots of family drama. It's got sunlight most of the time. It's going dark eventually. It's poignant. It's respectful of most of its characters. It's, it's very character driven. And on that level, it's, it's a, I think it's a three for me. I mean, it really is a perfect, I thought it was a perfect mix of drama and tragedy with with those subtle touches of humor, like like Ian said, and uh, I know we made the comparison, and you know I had written down uh, that it's an inversion of the of the Great American Frontier, the Homestead yeah, movie. That's, that's you point. know it's the exact co- polar opposite of First Cow, and then it's also um, you know we, we, we you know I mentioned Farewell before before the podcast, which is the Asian family like dynamic movie and the grandma movie, and then on top of that you have the um, kind of the people of of uh you know the minority family in um a different situation and that was waves yeah. which was you know they did waves about uh, a year ago which i loved waves too and on all those movies what you have is strong directors um sh- like kind of showcasing um an insight into these families and i think this one I, be, I don't know if the other two are writer director. I think all of them are writer director, but I do think mm-hmm. um, it ties together well that the, that, you know, yeah, to me, this is a pretty strong three. Um, and yeah. So. Well, uh, since you brought that up, I'll, I'll talk about now. Uh, it is semi-autobiographical for the, uh, the writer director. And it's interesting to me. Uh, so Lee I, I was reading something about it where. Lee what was that? Lee, Lee Isaac, Isaac Chung. Yeah. His name, yeah. Yeah. Uh, where he's talking about having to write his parents as characters uh, versus uh, knowing intimately. Um, but I like to think that this is his love letter to his grandmother. And what I really enjoyed was this portrayal of his sister because mm-hmm. uh, it, 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 he doted so much on all of his family members besides the sister in a sense that yeah. she was the aloof snarky one who mm-hmm. so I like, yeah, this is, it, it rings true. And that's, the, I think, one of the best parts about this is how honest it felt. Actually, Scott and I were having a discussion about uh, Nomadland versus this, where Nomadland was felt very voyeuristic, mm-hmm. that you're looking in on a, uh, uh, on a group. This felt very intimate, and you're welcomed into that family. And I think that's uh, a strength of it. But I still hold on to it, too. Yeah. Siva, what do you come down on, then, score-wise? Uh, I'm starting to give it a two. I, again, yeah. I just, like, I love this movie up until and i and i it's not like the worst ending in the world but that ending takes it from a three to kind a three. of threw it out yeah, yeah. I, I wanted to give a, con- a a counter to the the, the ending you know because i assume we're not going to go back to it because i i i actually usually don't like that con- feeling that i don't like feeling contrived and endings are usually where i do dink these movies for or ding them for um I thought this was actually pretty well done and pretty earned of it. It's right away. You see that burning. And to me, it's just a callback. It's the version of a gun. Right. And you know that everything he has eventually ends up in that barn. You don't see that, you, you know, you don't see it. You see the field, you see him working on it and producing on it. And then it gets in the field and he, he's trying to get everything out of this barn. And then you have a woman who was very strong and she finally, she's the one that actually suffers the illness, right? Not the little boy. And she's just trying to do her little help like while they're gone and that 
you know, she's a fire starter. Basically, she's the fire starter early in the movie with the family when she arrives and she becomes the person that takes it down. But then she is redeemed with the Minari at the end as well. So I actually thought it was quite poignant. And that's that's my counter. And then, you know, on top of it, we didn't even mention it, but I think the the perspective of the the boy as the lead is usually a, a fault, you know, and it was a excellent narration lead point into it. And then to end with him with the father again, um, but within the, like the fields of grandma, um, I think is pretty good. <laughs> yeah. I, I uh, just really quickly, I, I, I guess I should have been more clear. I, I actually don't have a problem with the, the fire happening, just everything about what the fire changed about their entire family dynamic felt contrived to me okay as far as like that like you know it's it was like they were like okay now we've been through a fire so we're all like all of our previous problems are gone and we're like this happy family now um so that that was kind of where i came gotcha. in and it's okay. like i said it's not the worst thing in the world but it does knock it down slightly for me so fair enough i feel i guess my final thought at least uh, on plot is that I agreed strong jokes, really well paced, just not perfectly paced, I guess, to me. So maybe the credit I'm taking away will come out in other questions, but I'm still thinking with very strong too. But uh, interesting that you're giving a three because you're normally the curmudgeon motherfucker over there who like <laughs> will give it the less score on plot. But it's uh, uh, three twos and a, and a three uh, for a plot. And that will move us right along. In fact, Joe, two themes with you. And uh, this one is uh, a pile uh, for sure, um, you know, and I think that's the depth of the story and the plot itself. The, the plot is sunk in the themes. It's not just kind of um, a size, a side of it or a piece of it. I mean, it starts from the beginning. They're making a transition. You have this representation of um, an immigrant diaspora, but like an inverted immigrant diaspora where it's a, a second time, right? It's not just like they've come from, you know, a war situation. They've come to uh, California and that's where, you know, you go to the city and that's where, you know, usually yep. initial immigration and they're going into the country. They're going the opposite way. Um, so to me, I have um, that, that immigrant diaspora, the importance of one's culture and the unseen long-term effects of war and military conflict, uh, generational differences, uh, loneliness, sure. um, fighting limitations and perceptions of others, starting over, aspirations and the American dream, independence, entrepreneurial spirit, value of hard work, progress versus starting over, like actually making that choice. Um, and then there was one that I really liked that was, was subtle. And they, they mentioned a couple of times, but um, the city versus the small, um, yeah. because not just the job, but Monica is a city girl and Jacob is a country boy. And they were kind of pushed together, or like decided on, on, in like a war environment where it was, seems like it wasn't arranged, but it was kind of um, not, um, per, you know, a perfect situation. It might not have um, happened no otherwise. Dream. Yeah. Um, then you have illness. Um, and the last one I, I'll deal with is faith. Um, you know, there's a lot of faith and divergences of faith. And then literally the, you know, Paul character carrying a cross, right? So it's just, it's embedded in that Southern, like, culture of faith. So, um, you know, this is a one for me. If I didn't get to the one part, um, this is a I one. I wrote down one as you were speaking. <laughs> Joe, I agree with a lot of what you said. I'm going to be a little sarcastic now. There is a lot. Uh, so I got fascinated by Dowsing by watching this movie and had to look it up and it turns out dowsing is slightly effective because basically if you know where uh water sort of lies using a stick to point the direction you're more likely to hit water than not uh so it's actually a lot of luck that goes into but it's, uh, it's, it's effective roulette. yeah effective luck where it's also the luck on the part of uh, you know and that whole faith-based thing that there is actually a lot like there is a lot of hard work they put in, but the grandmother kind of planting the seeds, them using dowsing to find water. Uh, it's an interesting discussion on the work ethic of America versus the success, like luck being a major factor in your success. Uh, but that was more of a sarcastic comment than that. I actually really liked the discussion and the, the work it did of entering a new community and trying to, uh, find your happiness and find your new uh social groups and i actually really like that the uh children in this got along really uh, adapted to the community very well and were welcomed more so than the adults were yeah no go ahead Sebo. well i was gonna say uh i thought it was really interesting you know every, everybody kind of touched on the faith uh part of it I, I thought it was really interesting that the 
you know, the character who's like the city person is, was the one who is really religious and the one who's from the country or likes, you know, prefers the country huh. is the one who's like atheist basically. Um, so I, I kind of like that and like kind of little turnabout uh, in terms of what they were doing there. Uh, uh, you know, in terms of your expectations on that type of thing. Um, and, you know, as you guys have said, the, uh, there's a lot going on in this and I think it handles everything that it's it it tries to do really well um this was one of my favorite parts of the movie just because i kept like every time i was like oh that's an interesting thing they were like kind of moving on um like all right think about that and then let's let's uh talk about something else like we without like hitting you over the head with any of these themes they're all there they're and they're all well represented so um i'm gonna give it a one yeah, I largely agree. Right. And like, I always give credit to, so Joe, you mentioned like four or five, six things, even like any one of them, two of them maybe could have been the focal point. But the fact that the movie impressively was able to like integrate and juggle them and like, like balance, so, yeah. sort of parcel them out throughout the whole story, right? From either small scale concerns up to like the American dream and, you know, a, a foreign family coming in and trying to make their way. I, I had to give a lot of credit on that front. And yeah, I think they were all integrated and just, again, sprinkled out, like, sort of sine waved up and down, but the through line remained throughout of the film and the story, and I thought that was one of the most impressive points, and I'm giving it a one as well. I think it's also important to note that they, out of all that, you know, and it, it could be tied later to the related dialogue or whatever, but these type of movies would fall into a trope of commu- like racism, right? Or like problems with the community. And that wasn't yeah, right. where it led, right? You watch these movies and you see an outsider come in, they're taking over a farm, they're on my land. There's no get off my land story here, no, which right. like, was very would, would happy to not kept. see. Yeah. yeah. That would even um, have to fall into. That's a good point. Yeah. I, on e, I believe you're giving it a one as well to themes. All right, yes. All right. So let us move on. Then this is kind of an interesting one. Steve-O who or what is the antagonist in this film? Um, it's, it's kind of interesting. There's like this weird, like flowing antagonist of illness kind of going on. Like, I know we spoke about that briefly in themes, but, um, there's like the, the illness of the body, like the, um, what's uh, Dave, uh, David. David's the kid, right? Yeah. Uh, David has this like heart issue, and then I don't know what, like two thirds of the way through the film, uh, the grandmother has a stroke and that's just really sad. And something, you know, similar happened to my grandmother when she was getting older. And it's like, it was a moment of like, holy shit, man. Like that's hit home. Uh, it was, it was very emotionally intense for me uh, just watching that scene. And then like, um, you know, and then there's the the illness of the land and their marriage and 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 all that type of stuff. Like, I think it's just this pervasive force of like almost um, entropy versus trying to keep everything together. You know, uh, and I know that's like super like out there. It's not very concrete at all. But like, there's not the concrete antagonist in this movie there's nobody there like you said there's nobody there it's like get off my land you know some like you know whatever generic southern you know hit character yelling at them because they're asian or whatever so it is the it is a more um uh abstract kind of yeah abstract insidious thing yeah but uh may i build off that for a second sure so if if this is the stereo, like one of the major ideas of the American dream, which is to go own your own land, own a large swath of land, build a, uh, perhaps in discussing that meta aspect of it, it's the immigrant uh, realization that coming to America to chase that dream is much more difficult than the reality actually says. There's a lot of work and go back to luck involved with it. Uh, but I also just want to say that... Uh, I just realized this is a retelling of Green Acres. Everything <laughs> up into to be, the one where the husband wants to stay at the farm and the wife's a city gal. Like, this is <laughs> legitimately a one to one. Anyway, but I, I think that that's uh, uh, the chasing the American dream and the difficulty of achieving that is uh, uh, a great antagonist. Yeah. Hey, man, it's the place to me. It's what I want to be. Mm-hmm. But I mean, like, yes, people, like, it, it, in, in other 
films or like other things, it would feel like any, the thing is, I agree with you, like Entropy, of course, is the antagonist of the entire universe, if you really want to get down to it, I suppose. But, and it would feel like a, a cop out in a sense, but I think in this movie, like at least something, some like sort of vague uh, iteration of it is, is the antagonist. And like, and it manifests itself in, I would say, myriad ways, right? Like, yeah, so like you said, David has a condition. So they're dealing with that as a family while they're struggling with the farm. And then, uh, you know, Grandma Ma comes to live with them. And then that, like, at first, like, she's sort of like gregarious and fun. And like, it, she's having fun with the kids, even though, but even with her relationship being strained with David, then that changes. And then she suffers an illness, right? So I, it, you're right. It switches like throughout, but it's still always there, like in the background, no matter what. And I think, again, it's very subtly, very nuancedly put in there and very effective. So I'm giving it a one. Yeah, I, I, I was, I'm on a little bit different, I guess, because if you're taking, I don't know who you're taking as the protagonist, obviously, but if you take Jacob as the protagonist, um, then the, the antagonist is either Monica, uh, the family, or, or the grandma coming in. Um, and I'm not sure if that's uh, a true, and there is antagonism there for sure, but I don't know if they're the ones fighting them more than they're just not um, necessarily on his side. Um, if you go on the, the whole scale, like you're saying with like entropy, you have the water supply being the yeah. enemy of him, right? You have land failure. Um, it also, my other thought was maybe taking, because of the way this movie is constructed, maybe the family is the protagonist and the antagonist is the outside world um, or even the grandma, right? Um, you know, that comes in and changes it up. Um, so I'm wishy-washy on who it is. And probably for that reason, I'm going to give it a zero. Um just because I think it's, it's not concrete and it's just really, it's, it's not, you know, I, sometimes I will lean to say it's okay. In this case, this is probably the one there, there is definitely a lot of things affecting the whole family and the family unit, but I think they lean on the themes and, and just like living life and they don't have an actual personification. So I'm going to give it a zero in this case. That's a fair point. Like, yeah, right. It, it can be like, you know, depending on your mods may vary, I guess we'll say. Right. And you're right. Like, so that's a good segue because it kind of does depend a bit on who you think the protagonist is. So with that, E, what do you think? Oh, this might be a little bit controversial, but I think that David is the protagonist of this. Uh, it, I think he's the XP of the yeah. author. Uh, it, 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 often, a lot of the characters are kind of, yeah, you're seeing the fights of the parents, but it's a child witnessing the parents fighting. A lot of this feels like it's a remembrance. And, I think that also flows into my description of the antagonist because autobiographies are inherent retrospects of your entire life uh, and the challenges of who made you into who you, you are on that day. And I think that his experience, because the writer director, I don't have the name in front of me, uh, did Lee, live Lee Isaac yeah, Chung. grew up on a farm in Arkansas. And I think it uh, to the point of directing this movie influences his life greatly. So um, that's the thing. Uh, I also find David one of the least interesting characters in this. Uh, so, the weird. Uh, uh, I think that it's yeah, it's a it's kid true, but uh, I think that the support the, it's one of the best supporting casts I've seen in a while. Uh, if if you go by my definition of the protagonist, so I might give this a softer zero, but a zero nonetheless. Interesting, because yeah, you know, to be fair, we talked about it like you and I at least uh, post movie discussion, like, and yeah, like. I, I can see, like, you can make an argument for the entire family being the protagonist, right? Or you can be like, like you said, Joe, maybe just Jacob. I think it's somewhere, like, between those two things. I think it does switch between, let's say, the first 25% roughly of the movie. I think it is from Jacob's perspective. But then it starts to change, starts to move away from him a bit, becomes more David in a sense, right? And you could even say it's from uh, the grandmother's perspective to a certain extent towards the end. But I think I'm going to cut it up between... Uh, Jacob and David, like, and mostly David, because yeah, it, in theory, in real life, it's it's Lee's, like, that's his sort of experience, like, you know, as as framed through it, such, right? So I still think that works quite a bit, like, and yeah, even though it's almost like, oh, this is a re really old callback, but it's like a uh, fucking Fury Road where Mad Max isn't isn't even the protagonist's own fucking movie, like, right? right? He's sort of just your your window into this world, mm -hmm. so that's fine. But you still get the perspective, and at least you're right. The um, the frameworks from it, like right when he, uh, I like that you mentioned that when they're watching their parents fight, right? It's from 
his yep. view more than theirs. So I think that works. I think that is the reason, though, I'm going to give it a one, even though it, like he might not be like the most fulfilling character unto himself, but that's because he's a child. But you are experiencing this world and this story through his eyes and through his uh, you know, perspective. So I'm, I'm, it might be a softer one, but because that's the way I cut it off and view it, I'm going to give it a one. Mm-hmm. What do you guys think? Yeah, I don't think um, I don't think David's the protagonist. Um, I do think he's the narrator. I think he's the people we're POVing through, uh, you know. And I don't think necessarily because you're a narrator means you're, you know, automatically um, the automatically the protagonist. I was I was talking with my lady after I watched the movie, and she did not watch the movie. But I I was just saying, you know, there are how many you know how many movies have you watched where it's just an omniscient narrator or just some other thing, you know? He is he's giving it a, a good spin, right? And he's leading into it. But to me, it kind of has to be David because he's the driving force of all of it, right? Because he's the one that gets them to Arkansas. And then he's the one that's keeping them in Arkansas and keeping them in that place. So everyone is reacting to him. So to me, that, that makes him probably the protagonist as much as I, I'd like to go against it. And if we're going on that, I, 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 you know, this is a, a medium to high level one. I think Stephen Young does a really good job in that performance. I think it's um, very muted and perfectly, uh, it just, it, it seems perfect. I don't know what he talks like normally, but I, you know, obviously I've seen him in other things. I've seen him in Burning, which is one of my favorite movies of the, the last five years. And it's like, He's an evil, evil motherfucker in a Korean movie. So I know he can play the Korean. And obviously people know he's in Walking Dead. But I mean, this is one of our, and he's in um, Sorry to Bother You is like this kind of awkward, creepy, weird neighbor. That's you know, right. So he's like, starts the, uh, so he's got this great breath. And this just shows this another side of it. So to me, um, you know, not the strongest like protagonist as in essence, but performance wise and how it guides the movie to everything else that we're talking about. I, I'd have to give it a one. All right, good, Zeal. Yeah, I mean, I'm torn between uh, rating Jacob and David and or David as the I'd say both protagonist. So. Um, I think it. I think to some degree, <laughs> I agree with every single person here. Is perspective on this <laughs> you know i could see either one or i could see both uh but so you're that, going with paul obviously <laughs> that being said yeah so paul's the main character <laughs> dragging his cross he's the heart all yeah. in his cross yeah uh but no it's I, I i'm gonna spare you guys my prevaricating and trying to figure out what i think is the main character and just say that i will judge them both as the main character in terms of this and um uh-huh. That being the case, I think they are both really interesting characters. Uh, Jacob, because mostly, or a lot, because of Stephen Yeun's performance, as you just said, Joe, um, he is fucking phenomenal in this film, as he is in, in a lot of other stuff that he's done, uh, like you mentioned. And uh, David, I really like the um, the way that the film shows his relationship with everybody in this family and like kind of plays everybody off of him his like shyness with people outside of the family and grandma his grandmother who he never knew like how he kind of hides behind his mom's skirt and uh his he has like this teacher student relationship with his father um and you know his like his sibling is always kind of you know they're always kind of antagonizing each other a little bit but not too much and you can tell that there's like uh, yeah you can tell that there's like a love there between them so like his just the way that his relationships bounce off of all the other characters i think is really strong so uh for both of them i they would both be a one if i counted them separately so i'll if i'm counting them both together it's a one all right fair enough you stick with the zero on this one all right i just want to say one more thing this is for you and me joe i guess so why well, i said the e2 things is that i've in an alternate reality, this is the precursor to Walking Dead. Like, this is what he was doing before he became Glenn in Walking Dead. <laughs> yeah. And also, Steve Young had a, a, a nice... He was dropping mud pies in uh, I Think You Should Leave. That's <laughs> true. I think so it's true. He, yeah. he did show up in that one as well. But anyway, so... That's he, did, he didn't wipe either. Yeah, yeah exactly. That's, why. <laughs> so anyway, that's, a, that's a private oh, yeah. in-joke thing. But three ones and a zero on that, and I'll move along to secondary. So I think you guys sort of, like, uh, initially talked it out, like, yeah, the cast is great. It's a small cast, but they're just so robust, I guess is the word I want. And all of them do a great job. And sorry, I don't have all the actor, all the other actors in front of me, but Seawell can probably give them out to you, give them credit and all. But yeah, because it's a core family dynamic 
And it was just so well written, directed, and believable and performed for sure. And yeah, like Paul, like of course, like what's his name? Will Will Penn. Will Penn. He's he's in everything. Go look him. He's been in a thousand fucking things as like a bit ish part, much like he's in this one. But I would say like if we're cutting, if indeed I count, which I do, David and and Jacob as mostly joint protagonists, that means Grandmama is a secondary character and is like the best one I think by far, and a great performance by the by the actress. So. Yeah, it all fills out. And even like the community around them, like the brief interactions, they go to church and like um, the, the guy they sell, like the doctors and the guy they sell the, the produce to and all that. But I'm just saying the, the sister and like everyone who isn't who, who I deem the protagonist is definitely awesome in the secondary role. And I'm giving them a one. And that's all for me. Yeah, I mean, this is um, this is. Yeah, one of the strongest ensembles, of fre- especially of fresher faces that I've seen in years. Yeah, it's yeah. not just that they're, you know, uh, they're all Korean and that you haven't seen them in movies. I think some of them have some experience. Some of them have crazy experience. But, uh, you know, we didn't, I don't know if you guys looked at it, but David has never made an acting performance. This is his first performance. Oh, wow. So That's on incredible. that essence, this kid, I think, um, strikes gold. You, you know, know, I he, hate children um, actors. Exactly. A hundred percent. I am right on the, you know, I, I literally write that, you know, I hate kids. I mean, I have a rule, uh, it's called the Dana rule. And if there's an annoying teenage girl that turns, joins a, a show like in Homeland, um, I, I get the show ends and I don't watch it anymore. Um, uh, you know, it happened to me in the Americans. It happens to me many times where sure. it just become a nag and David, um, you know, it, it's, 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 it's silence. It's the moments when he's running and, you know, he's about to run and you could see in his face that he's not allowed to, there's, there's still restraint there. And he's still like uh, wide eyed. I think he speaks well. None of it sounds choppy. I think it's like this movie overall, we'll get into in like the dialogue, but does a great job of it flows a little English Korean. And, you know, he plays the game, this movie, um, you know, I actually give the credit on that, especially with a first time kind of lead actor, you know, to the director for casting this person and then putting him in a position to succeed with these other really strong people. I mean, to me, this was like the most memorable kind of kid primary type role since uh, Beast of the Southern Wild, like uh, Coven Johnny Wallace, which is probably one of my favorite of those type of movies. I think she's, you know, that I, I thought she was going to be like a superstar, honestly, or even like Dakota Fanning. I watched Man on Fire the other day, you know, like she's actually great in that movie. The movie's you know, a two and a half hour piece of whatever, but oh, she's, you know, good she's great in it and her moments are great. So um, uh, David's great. I, I think we haven't really mentioned it, but I think Monica, I think is really, really good. Her name is okay. Han Yuri. She gives the same like counterpoint, the same thing Jacob does. She should get just as much credit pretty much as Steven Yoon, but she does it on the, on the other side. Um, you know, it's, it's, a, and it's a real partner. It's a, a real wife. It's not like a, a doting, you know, type part it's a frustration part and it's multi-layered it's nuanced and it's really done uh, so that's Han Yuri. and then um the kid's name's Alan S. Kim and then you have the grandmother um who has been in stuff I mean it's one of the craziest like it looks like she's um I don't even like Martin Landau or like Christopher Plummer she has so many credits yeah. but the only movie I'd really recognize was The Housemaid which is a pretty interesting kind of movie from about 10 years ago um and, you know, she's a long time. It's just one of those, like, find, you know, you find it and she's perfectly for this role. And then lastly, Will Patton, which you said is in a bunch of stuff. And, you know, this is a personal thing that I thought of right away when you said the A24 and First Cow, he was in Meek's Cutoff, which is another Kelly Reichardt movie okay. playing like a, a farmer going to Oregon right in the Oregon trail. So you have this like, he's like dragging along and they're all kind of dying in the middle of the, you know, it's like this filmed in the square uh, first, co- first cow type. And now the opposite, he's dragging the cross the other way. He's got <laughs> the googly eyes. Um, and, you know, he's built this career of like now being, you know, he never was a star cause he's not like super, ha- like he's not like Mr. Handsome, but he's Mr. Like Southern. Like you can feel it from him and he gets those like um, twang roles and like, you know, kind of like bad guy roles. I think he's like gone in 60 seconds or something like that you know I, that comes to my yeah. mind. and the last thing that i'll say just for me is i've been listening to his voice so much lately because he's the voice of many stephen king audiobooks and wow, so really i mean that makes uh, sense. perfect if it, if it bleeds i think it's like 17 hours i just finished and he's the <laughs> voice of like holly give me holly give me you know and i'm just like so when i saw him not doing like very strong reading of uh, stephen king i just like another range sh- showcase so um, all in all, this, you know, this is a, a strong, strong one. I know uh, I didn't say that. I never say the number first, 
uh, rarely, but I got you. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I have to agree. Uh, not much more to say, but as you mentioned, Monica is really good in this. Uh, the grandmother is really great in this. Uh, and Paul are three kind of standouts. The one thing I did want to mention is the daughter Anne gets kind of short shrift in this yep. movie. Um, I wish they had done more with that character. Oh. And I know your point from earlier, Ian, I know you're, I know you're about to jump on me. I know your point from earlier is it's from the kid's point of view. So like he's, it's him like editing his sister out of whatever, but I, I did want to see more of kind of how she fit into that family dynamic. Cause we didn't really get much of that. Um, I you had enough, though, but I, that I, said, yeah. Uh, the, the other, the other side of the, I mean, the, the rest of the cast I think is really strong and, and really multidimensional. I, I found the performances and the you know what was on the page the script uh, really did all of them justice and i and i really loved them so it's gonna be a strong one for supporting with my one little caveat Steve, you, know, you cut mike completely out of your autobiography so you should <laughs> be complaining unless i, I forget you even have a brother buddy <laughs> I, I think we should all aspire to be more like the grandmother in this uh she was phenomenal actually she sold, sold the entire movie to me i i loved every scene she was in and uh, I don't know if I mentioned this earlier, but I kept thinking this reminds me a little bit of my girl specifically with uh, the tragic turn towards it. Uh, and I felt that the grandmother was just as heartbreaking of the scene of what happened to her. Uh, perhaps even more so because in my girl, it's the bees and this one, it's the, the, the stroke of an older a loved one. And I felt that uh, heavily, perhaps it's me being older too, but I mean, it hits home. Like you said, yeah. like, and even see what's it. All right. Well, I guess that means it's one's all around for secondary. I mm-hmm. think well, well earned and well deserved. All right, move along, Joe. I think you mentioned it briefly before our dialogue. Yeah, I mean, you know, we've talked about it. It's not. It, it's this is a subtle movie. It is a quieter movie, um, but and it's. I think um, we, you know, the the ver- going back and forth between the languages. Um, it it actually speaks in very. Ch- choppy but it also seems very real and for that alone in it's like kind of naturalism in the immigrant experience of you know learning language and being still interacting with the people around them um you know i you know i, I would give it a one for that but um i also just actually appreciate the opposite whereas there's just not many monologues we did watch nomadland recently which i feel has these like everyone go on screen and talk as long as you want and we'll film it and then we'll be in the dark around a, a circle of fire you know i like the movie but i do think there that it's you know when you get to a certain point it becomes either unrealistic or preachy and to me this uh, doesn't do that and then the only person that uh, actually just sounds like is like the eccentric is the grandma and she gets the best lines and she can deliver them right you have uh, you know Stephen Yin can be very charismatic in this movie he's very um, dour and, and, removed. and removed and you know growing a little bit of a beard right he's trying to grow his his uh, you know his, his his frustration beard in um, you know but even from the opening scene right there's the and you know I really liked you know it, it's like you hear him say Gart like um garden like they're talking about the garden because they say you said we're gonna have a garden like i don't like they almost went there and they didn't think he was gonna they didn't know they were farming they thought he just wanted to build a garden yeah. so they're coming here right and then he says you know but i, I want to build the garden of eden right the garden of eden is big i think is the line and yeah, it's, it's like very that. it's very you know and then it goes right to the sun like there's this great exposition in the first like three minutes but it's not bad exposition it's like we've moved here you know, after they get out of the car, um, they go to the, find the water source there. It's a heaven. They go to the thing. Um, you know, you see it in Monica's face. She doesn't say anything, but you know, she's not happy with where they're going, where they are. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I think the Isaac Chung who directed it, wrote this as well, did a great job. Um, and, you know, I have a couple of grandma quotes here. I might as well, uh, you know, throw them out there. there. Yeah. Uh, bring that mountain water. I, the, all the lines about mountain water yeah, and Mountain Dew you. is, <laughs> it, and like basically being a 15 minute advertisement for Mountain Dew. <laughs> and uh, is, is, it's like amazing, honestly. Yeah. Um, you know, and there's a couple of things he says about the family, but, you know, people come to America and they forget everything. And you like, you make this kid do all the kinds of crap, you know, like it's just, and then just so many jokes. And then the last, the dialogue they have around the cards and the playing the games yes, thank and everything you. else, I think we're, um, you know, and that comes back again when he's playing it with the friend and he curses at the friend <laughs> you know, in bad. Korean, um, you know, he learns the words. And I think that let alone is like, you know, the grandma makes it and David lives it. So, um, you know, 
one, strong one for me too. I got both. Yeah, I mean, I completely agree with that. I, I love the dialogue of this movie. Um, I'm not quite as prepared as Joe, so I don't have any uh, any quotes written down. But you know, I, I just feel like it it flows naturally. Um, doesn't seem like you said. Doesn't seem preachy. At no point is there like somebody like no, that was a very good point. I, the most preachiness you get is, uh, you know, uh, Jacob teaching uh, David how to do things or like, you know, telling him his personal philosophy about things, which that's father's son stuff. That's going to exactly. be standard operating. Procedure. And, and yeah. I, and I love those parts, you know, like those, uh, those parts are great. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I think that the dialogue of this movie is really strong and it gets a strong one. So I'm going to mention two other movies here uh, to make a point on this. Uh, you have th- this movie, which is dealing with marriage issues. And the nice thing is that they reconcile to a certain level towards the end of it. You have a separation, which is one of my favorite movies of all time. Um, and then you have marriage story. And the thing is, oftentimes when you're dealing with troubles, especially when you go for the full uh, divorce, it becomes, uh, I mean, there's a great dramatic moments in those films, uh, <clears throat> but it's played up for the drama and the fall of the relationship where this one always has that uh, oftentimes has that slow boil of are they going to uh, like where you're where you don't know what the outcome is going to be of their marriage throughout this and it's always kind of it, to me not to say that the other ones aren't realistic because they are the, the marriage is very complicating especially the end of one but this one felt very natural in the sense that it's dealing with the teetering of a relationship and the fr- natural frustrations that build up over a move one that the wife wasn't even really expecting, as you mentioned. <laughs> so I, uh, I, I very much appreciated the, the drama- the subdued dramatic impact of their relationship. No, I think that's really well said, and I, I agree. I'm giving Dad like one of the strongest ones as well. And like, yeah, like I definitely appreciate it, and especially as more as the film went on and t- it ties back to the plot, I suppose, where it, it's just the moments of levity are perfectly sprinkled, but they make so much natural sense to the family dynamic that was set up already and yes the grandmother gets some of the best lines when she's like playing cards and calling them like haha you bastard like you know i love that shit right mm-hmm. and like so like it, it just switches seamlessly between like those sweet tender moments and very tense moments when like when jacob and monica are having a fight or whatever right so like and you're right like and one of you mentioned whoever did the fact that they're sort of um they're speaking korean like Largely, but they also sprinkle in English, right? And especially when you're actually in other men's community. So that felt very natural as well. And again, without being overbearing, without being exposition-y or preachy and on all the things that are usually negative connotations, the film and the script avoided all of that. And I think that's a huge credit and I'm going to give it a one as well for all of that. Well, we, I wanted to, I thought someone you're else, good. I didn't want, I want to cover everything, but I thought I was someone else would cover the toilet humor, but I do yeah. think there is the lines of, you know, um, her the, oh, yes. discussing a penis with the yeah. grandma, broken and, ding dong, broken <laughs> penis. And he's yeah. like, it's not a penis. It's a ding dong. Yeah. Um, you know, like that's, yeah, you're right. I had broken like, ding dong written down and say, and though. then when she calls and, him out in front of his friend <laughs> at church, <laughs> right. And then it comes back that she's, you know, she's the one that, you know, right. There's a, yeah. there's a puddle. The, the second puddle comes yeah. back, you know? So, I mean, even in the humor, there is this, uh, this, this deep sadness that I, I think, um, you know, really, you know, pervades the movie. And, you know, I mentioned the farewell earlier, and I was thinking about it a lot because of this grandma role and how much we love the grandma and everyone loved the grandma in that movie too. But that movie felt inevitable, right? All of it felt inevitable. And this movie, like Ian said, you weren't sure where it was going. Um, I think, you know, we talked about the ending and maybe some parts of the contrivance, but at least it, was not inevitable. It actually, there were different strands and they're all being addressed sometimes in the same pieces of dialogue. Yeah. And I, I think that, that, you know, just speaks uh, volumes for, for the, for the script. Yep. Yeah. I think right on. I think we all agree. Strong ones on dialogue. All right. Moving along then, Steve-O, tell us about the style. Uh, this is, I, I love the style of this movie. I think that the cinematography is awesome, both inside and outside. Um, I, you know, if you're watching us, you can see one of the shots behind me. I think this is one of the like ad, though one of the shots that was in the ads or whatever. Promo pick, yeah. Uh, but there's just so much. There's a lot of green in this, like you mentioned earlier, Joe. There's a lot of like daylight, very vibrant, stuff like that. Until eight twenty four. And yeah, and and it really comes through. Uh, you know, 
that's that's becoming a a hallmark of a24 movies but um it's just done really really well in this flick and um i gotta give them full credit for that uh i'm having trouble like remembering the music on this the score on this it's very discordant actually it's it doesn't match up very well but it, it's quite good uh it's eerie almost it's a piano score yeah, i think and it, right? and it wasn't yes. like pervasive either like it was there in certain scenes but not like throughout if, if i recall correctly anyway it was almost like a horror movie leftover but like placed over this movie like, it was john carpenter's lost themes yeah, yeah yeah all right yeah i mean i i wish i i, I i'm pretty positive i'm gonna watch this movie again at some point so i have to pay attention to that next time but uh well, yeah, I'll leave, I'll leave it there and let you guys talk about whatever you want to talk about. No, I know. I mean, I'm just don't have much more to say. I'm definitely giving uh, style one and that I guess the two things I have is frame framing and blocking. And maybe Joe, like you might notice that too. Cause like being a, a film aficionado is like in terms of that specifically. And like, yeah, to your point, Steve, oh, that's what I noticed the most. And yeah, it's very vibrant, very open. Of course, they're in the farm of Arkansas, right? For the most part. So it's sunlight. And like, there's one or two scenes where the tornado is coming, the storm hits or whatever. But I'm just saying, for the most part, and because it's intimate, like, they're crammed in a little, like, not, like, RV, like, Nomadland style, but in their, like, you know, their, the house that they have on the farm, which isn't necessarily a traditional house. So I just think it all works. And, yes, Evo, the, uh, the soundtrack, the score was, was fine. It, w- it was, like, maybe not perfectly fitting, matching, but it still kind of made sense. And I noticed it was, like, it was there, but not... Um, throughout the whole film. It showed up and then, then sort of went away when it needed to. So that's all. I'm giving it a one. What do you guys think? Pacing-wise, uh, and I really loved the uh, sprinkling of humor, as I mentioned before. And someone else, uh, and I just want to say this again, is that this has the best product placement of all time. Uh, <laughs> so uh, overall, I really enjoyed the style the of this. Uh, colors, all that. You've, you've said it all, so I'm just going to pass it on. Um, yeah, well, I'm going to give a little shout out for that house because I think that house is actually a very interesting choice. You could you could have just put it in a normal small house, but literally put it in that place and that gives you this kind of, um, you know, trailer park feel. You're like putting a, the Koreans in the trailer park, you know, and it's a very interesting vibe um, that that house becomes part of them because they have this huge property, but they have this dank yeah. place that they're like you know they have to they have no water at certain points and they're starting the buckets and they're going to the river and everything else so i, I think uh that house specifically is designed very well um I, I was thinking about it and this is a little bit in the plot and themes but you know this is a period piece that doesn't overdo the timing that it's placed in so it's part of it it gives it good reason to not cheat on certain things it's obviously because of the story of the and the timing of the character but it is this uh it, it's it's a morning in America story, right? It's a Reagan esque, like it's a failure of Reaganism kind of story, like where everyone just moves and it's morning again. And this this I think you know uh, Jacob believes that, and that's why he's mm-hmm. left. Um, you know, we're not mentioning the job too much, but the whole point of this is that he hates his job that he's good at, right? He hates that he's checking if if a chicken is a man, and if it is, they're going to light it on fire. Um, and that is it. Um, they're literally killing half of a crop of, of animals. And his job is if he picks them and they're a, ma- a, a male, they're going to die. If he drops them, they die. So he wants to grow something. And, um, you know, this morning again feeling is really there. Again, I mentioned again to the plot devoid of, devoid of racism. I thought that was a really great stylistic choice because it's not just everything else. That's easy, easy to fall into. And there is like quick moments of it with like the little... I actually really liked how they chose little scenes with the other kids. Um, and, and it wasn't like a hundred of them. It was one and it was good. And there was a father and you're like, is it going to be the abusive father thing or a drunk? He was cheating on his wife. I think they inferred, like I was here all it's night. Very applied, but, but, even still, but it isn't like, like, like rape, like a rape scene or like, you know, something like is something dark going to happen? Cause they're getting him in this other house. They're leaving the compound, right? They, they don't usually leave that house otherwise. Um, and the last thing I would say is, um, yeah, I mean, that's the standard, but the slight alterations on standard tropes is very important to me. I always think, you know, if you, that's part of the unexpected. And the last thing was the, like, do Korean directors grow on trees, uh, like good ones? Because this is, seems, seems like another one. I know he's American Korean and it's a different vibe, but I mean, obviously Parasite won Best Picture last year. Um, there, it's the first he foreign movie to do that. What's that? Did I mention it? No, no we mentioned it like uh, pre-discussion. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you know, and 
you know, that's a, Bong is different. Park Chan, Park Chan, well, all these, there's a whole collective of them that if people don't know, you know, aren't as familiar, but this is an American story told that way. You know, you have a Stoker even was like a, you know, a, a Dracula version of this. And, um, you know, I don't know if it's a recency bias, but it just seems these directors have a great sense of character and letting their characters live. And that's where I got from Parasite too. You have this family and it's very focused on them. And yes, there are other people involved in it, but it's still, even though it's a larger tale, it's kept very insular and it makes it feel very full. So, um, yep. great job. Yep. I feel you. All right. We have strong ones all around. ID, bring us on home. You recommend uh, Minari or not? On two levels, I recommend it. One, I enjoy this film. I think other people would. But two, I actually think that there is a skepticism in America of uh, subtitled films. And I actually think that this is a brilliant primer for people who otherwise wouldn't watch the past films. And where Parasite was kind of more for the intelligence. This is a foreign look at, at America with love of not just America, but like Midwestern, uh, Mid-South America. Mm. And it, 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 it's not condescending, but uh, it, it shows the warts, but it does show it with a love there. So I think that the, I looked it up quickly. It's got a 98% uh, uh, Rotten Tomato score from critics. It's got a 90% audience score. And I can see a lot of people who otherwise wouldn't enjoy uh, subtitle movies enjoying this because it's kind of being like, oh, you're good too. Like, uh, uh, and so, yeah, I, overall, I do give it a one. Yeah. I think a, a really important part of all of this is that um, this director is, you know, was raised in Arkansas, you know, like he on lived his farm it. in Arkansas and like knows his shit and also is an incredibly talented director, <laughs> just happens to be an incredibly talented director as well. But like, you know, I think that the important thing is that it's a lived American experience that he's telling. Um, and that is something that like is is there's a lot of people that have had similar experiences to this that you know haven't had a chance to tell their story but you know in the in the 80s and 90s there was i i you know have a lot of friends that i went to high school with who had similar stories growing up where they came over when they were you know really young or their parents came over right before they were born or whatever and um you know, it's, and you know, you have these like multi uh, lingual households and kids usually speaking more English than their parents. And like, there's that whole thing that like, they definitely address in this, but they don't, you know, again, they don't hit you over the head with it. Anyway, all that to say, I, I really enjoyed this movie quite well, indeed recommending it. I am definitely recommending it. Go out, give it a look and have a good time. Hi right, Joe. What do you think? I'm yeah, I mean, every point if you look at my points uh i don't know how i couldn't you know what do you think <laughs> um so you know it is a good story it's dynamic and there are no turnoffs i think a lot of times you could see there if you really don't like slow you know slower movies okay maybe you know if you're just an action person then yeah this isn't going to be for you but as long as you enjoy a, a good story with interesting characters this hits all of the points and i agree with ian on the, the language thing i've always um, hit that struggle with with a lot of people, you know, telling me that. And it, it was interesting because I think one of the first times I heard about this movie, um, more recently, at least more recently, um, with the Golden Globes, it was nominated, I think, for Best Foreign Film, yep. even though it's U.S. produced, it's U.S. director, it's, um, you know, a starring a U.S. I mean, Stephen Yeun is Korean, but he, I believe he's a Korean American. Yep. Um, so, you know, it's it's kind of like a false, <laughs> like a false foreign movie. It's a false shit movie. <laughs> yeah, but it is, uh, it's good. And, it you know, it, most of the time, these movies will have that scene where in the beginning, it'll be a parent saying, we're in America now, start talking in English. And then that will be the home of it'll be in English, even though yeah. they're not. Didn't yeah, do that, yeah. didn't fall into it. And, you know, for me, this it makes it even more uh, yeah, natural and real and, you know, can't recommend it. And recommendable. Yep. Yeah, I mean, I agree with you guys, of course. I do recommend it. Uh, I know it was an on Nomad Land, but I would recommend it above that. And just in general, like for everything you guys just talked out and all the points we just said, we're giving it a very strong score of all, which I'll give it to you in a second. But I officially do recommend it. Yeah, it's worth watching. 
has something to say, is engaging, and extremely well acted, written, directed, etc. So, definitely one for my official recommendation. So, uh, before I give the scores, anything you guys uh, forgot or wanted to add or missed or anything? Not good. Alrighty, so it comes down to three nines and an eight. Uh, Steve-O, myself, or sorry, yes, me, Steve-O, and Joe have given it nines. You gave it an eight because you take it off, off a point for plot and, and tag. Otherwise, we agreed. Oh, tag. I'm sorry, yes, you're right, pro tag. Otherwise, we agreed on twos for plot, aside from Joe, and ones to everything else, which is an 8.75 overall, which, yeah, is fucking damn strong. And I think yes. it's, it's exactly pretty much what it's earned. And I do think I, I at least am for it being pushed for maybe if not best pick, although that'd be fine, too, like whatever. Uh, yeah, like some of the actors, like I guess Steve Young is up for it seems like it's, he's going to get a push for it. And I think some of the supporting act actors in this film should also definitely get recognition at least as we have, and we've tried to recognize them. But yeah, that's where uh, Minari stands, and you know, it's it's one of the better A24 films in general, and certainly of this year, and they're killing it still, so. Mm -hmm. I, I, think, uh, I think that it proves, though, you know, the one thing the Oscars has been missing for a while, I think SAG does it, but there is no best ensemble category. And this supporting versus best actor, best actress, and one person gets to win. I know there's historical precedence for it. Sure. Uh, movies and mo are more and more filled with, you know, and, and it's been throughout, but especially now, I feel like it isn't so driven. You know, we watched North yeah. by Northwest last week and you have a star movie and then you have all these little shit parts and it's still two mm -hmm. hours long. This movie is two hours long and every part is is worthy of, Matter, of, yeah. of, of, of actually uh, giving credit to. So, well, just, I mean, we've come a long way in 70 years, buddy, but uh, personal soapbox <laughs> of that uh, credit for everybody. That's no, all. I get you and I, I generally agree with that just for sure. But either way, I think that'll do it. Minari, 8.75. Damn good movie. Check out the performances and everything else we said. It's worth a watch, 100%. So I've been here uh, trying to farm Minari myself and uh, in danger of having it burned down by my friends. I'm just Scott Thurlow here with Stephen Amosi. I'm uh, just carrying my old cross down the road. Mm -hmm. And Joe Soria. I'm the fastest chicken checker in the Midwest. <laughs> you sure are. <laughs> and Jonathan Ian Manzer. Steve, you know, between the two of us, I have a call on the cross. So, <laughs> uh, you just have to have a duel and see who's the best cross bearer, obviously. <laughs> and that'll be coming up next time sometime soon. <laughs> Otherwise, thank you so much for joining us. We've been the Lost Signals, and we'll catch you next time. Cheers. Editing and engineering by Stephen Hermosi. Music by Christopher Morgan. Check us out on YouTube and iTunes for the shows, and on Facebook and Twitter for updates. Or Mott?